In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. My brothers and sisters, as we come to the altar of God here at church, to the altar of our hearts at home, we acknowledge our sins. We also praise God for his mercy and love. We now prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. Lord Jesus, you are mighty God and Prince of Peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the Son of God and Son of Mary, Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the Word made flesh and splendor of the Father. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, increase our faith, hope, and charity, and make us love what you command, so that we may merit what you promise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, shout with joy for Jacob, exult at the head of the nations, proclaim your praise and say, the Lord has delivered his people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them back from the land of the north. I will gather them from the ends of the world with the blind and the lame in their midst, the mothers and those with children. They shall return as an immense throng they departed in tears, but I will console them and guide them. I will lead them to brooks of water on a level road so that none shall stumble. For I am a father to Israel, Ephraim is my firstborn. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, every high priest is taken from among men and made their representative before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal patiently with the ignorant and erring, for he himself is beset by weakness. And so for this reason must make sin offerings for himself as well as for the people. No one takes this honor upon himself, but only when called by God just as Aaron was. In the same way, it was not Christ who glorified himself in becoming high priest, but rather the one who said to him, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Just as he says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. As Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, Jesus is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see Jesus told him, go your way, your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. They say that seeing is believing. In order to believe in something, we have to see it with our own two eyes. And for the most part, that's true, although sometimes our senses do deceive us. Still, seeing Uh, is believing. But then so too is the opposite. We can say that believing is seeing. That is, in order to see something, it's helpful if we first believe in it. Uh, A good example of of this comes from astronomy. In 1781, astronomers had discovered the planet Uranus. But when they noticed, what they noticed here was that Uranus is being pulled out of its regular orbit. They, and they wondered why this was the case. And so they used their knowledge about, about uh, body masses and gravitational pull to come up with a theory. The theory was that there must be some other um, astronomical body near Uranus that was of sufficient size to pull Uranus toward itself. In short, they figured out that there must be another planet around here somewhere. They hadn't seen this other planet. They hadn't seen it but they believed in its existence based on the evidence. And they searched for and eventually found this other planet, Neptune. So seeing is believing to an extent, but the the opposite is also true to an extent. Believing leads to seeing. Believing leads to seeing. And this is something that which uh, both science and faith have in common. Seeing is believing and believing is seeing. But this kind of believing we do as a people of faith is not a blind believing. Instead, it's what we might call a reasonable belief, a reasonable belief. When the astronomers discovered Neptune, uh, they weren't searching the galaxy blindly. They were guided by evidence and by reason, as well as a certain type of faith, 
uh, in the evidence. When we go, as a people of faith, when we go in search of God, we don't go onto the path of faith blindly and just look for God wherever. Instead, we're guided by evidence and by reason, along with a certain type of faith, which comes from the Holy Spirit. For instance, when we look at, this is evidence, when we look at anything that moves and changes, which is everything, we see that everything is moved and changed by something else. The leaves rustle in the trees because the wind moves them. Uh, The wind moves because of the shifting of low and high pressure systems. Those systems of pressure move and change because of the rotation of the earth, among other things. The earth moves and rotates because of gravitation, inertia, the sun, and a host of other things. Gravitation is caused by something. Inertia is uh, brought into being by something else. The sun uh, and its effects are caused by forces that created it, and so on and so on. Everything moves and changes because some other force acts upon it and makes it move and change. That's kind of the evidence we have as a people of faith as we search for God. The evidence, a chain of causes that goes way back in time toward infinity. But, people have said through the ages, but there must be something, some force, which started this whole chain reaction we call life. There must be something which started it all. It's like a line of dominoes. Each domino falls on the other. It forces others to move and then to fall onto others. Well, what about that very, very first domino? How did that very first domino get pushed to move? It didn't move itself. Instead, it was moved by something which itself was not moved. In our tradition, uh, which goes back to the ancient Greeks, in our tradition, this first cause of life was called the unmoved mover. The unmoved mover. In our search for God as a people of faith, we start with what we know. To an extent, we believe in this infinitely complex chain reaction we call life. We start with that. We believe in this, and then we go in search of that unmoved mover, the uncreated creator who started it all in the beginning. Believing is seeing. Believing in an uncreated uh, creator, believing in an unmoved mover, based on the evidence, leads us to discover and to see this root of all things, the one we know as God. Seeing is believing, but so too, believing is seeing. Believing leads to seeing. If we don't believe in a God, then any search for God is, of course, going to be fruitless. But if we do have this reasonable belief in a God, then we will find God, and God will find us. We hear about Bartimaeus today. He was a blind man, but he could see so clearly what many others who had sight could not see. He could see Jesus for whom and what he was, not because he could see what Jesus was doing, the miracles that he was doing, but because of what others had told him about Jesus. Based on the evidence, what else could Bartimaeus believe about Jesus other than he was the son of David, the Christ? For Bartimaeus, belief led to sight. Belief led to awareness of and intimacy with God. For Bartimaeus, believing was seeing. It's like when Jesus says to the crowds in the Gospel of Luke, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say immediately that it's going to rain, and so it does. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The crowds had plenty of evidence about what the weather was going to be just by looking up in the sky. And so they responded to this evidence. Why then would they not believe in Jesus and respond to him when they had plenty of evidence about him and who he was? Now I don't know, of course, but perhaps they had a long time ago stopped believing that the Messiah was ever going to come or that the Christ was even a reality, maybe. Maybe their minds and their hearts 
were so grounded in the world that they just couldn't even see the possibility of something so wonderful as God himself coming to be among them. They had vision, they could see with their eyes, but they couldn't see. Bartimaeus didn't have vision, but he could see very clearly. And the difference? Bartimaeus believed first. And so he could see God. So what does all this matter, this believing in order to see? Well, the most obvious connection is with our life as Catholics. If we want to know God, we have to first believe in God. The evidence for God is abundant. Our faith is a reasonable faith. If we want to be a people of hope and vision, a people of deep contentment and fortitude, a people of knowledge and wisdom, we have to first believe in God who is the source, who is the uncreated creator of all these things. So believing is seen when it comes to our life as Catholics and in our relationship with the Lord. But this also impacts our interactions with each other and with ourselves too. There's the saying, you know, if you look for the bad in someone, you will surely find it. If you look for the bad in somebody, you will surely find it. In other words, if you only ever believe that someone is bad, then that's all you'll ever see in that person. Believing is seeing. When we think about all the tensions in the world today, even amongst uh, neighbors and friends within the church, how often uh, is this the case? We disagree with somebody on this issue or that issue, and then our whole belief about that person is that everything that person says or does is wrong. He or she can do nothing right. And the effect of this is, of course, the total breakdown of conversation, the total breakdown of community and communion. And just the opposite is true as well. We might agree with someone so much that our belief about that person is that everything this person says or does is just wonderful. They can do no wrong. That belief also leads to a breakdown of conversation and community and communion. This kind of believing doesn't lead to sight or clarity. It leads to blindness and confusion. The remedy is to take to heart this idea that believing is seeing. If I find that I'm always at odds with somebody else, always at odds with somebody else, what is it that I believe about this person? Do my beliefs about my neighbors, my enemies, need to be changed in order for me to see more clearly? Seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. And to an extent, that's true. But so too is the opposite. Believing is seeing. If we believe in God, we will surely find him and see his effects. If we believe in the basic goodness of our friends and our enemies, we will surely see that goodness and be healed. God, help us to examine our beliefs so that we can see life clearly and live life fully. And once again, we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And let us pray. For the church, her leaders, and all the faithful, that in the midst of a secular age, 
she would be strong in faith and in vision. Let us pray to the Lord. For local, state, and national leaders, that the consciences of all would be touched and moved by the grace of God, let us pray to the Lord. For those who are concerned about employment and family income, that they believe in God's care for them and be hopeful of heart, let us pray to the Lord. For those who are homebound, those in nursing homes and hospitals, and those on the margins and in need, let us pray to the Lord. For the prayers written in our parish books of prayer, and for the prayers we offer to the Lord from the altar of our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. For all those who have fallen asleep in Christ, and for the family and the friends of St. Clair Parish for whom this Mass is offered, let us pray to the Lord. And we call upon the intercession of St. Joseph. Hail, guardian of the Redeemer, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To you God entrusted his only Son. In you Mary placed her trust. With you Christ became man. Blessed Joseph, to us too, show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace, mercy, and courage, and defend us from every evil. Amen. Lord God, we come before you with our prayers. We ask you to hear them and also all the prayers of the saints made on our behalf and to answer them according to your good will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Look, we pray, O Lord, on the offerings we make to your majesty, that whatever is done by us in your service may be directed above all to your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed man in your own image, and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder, to rule in your name over all you have made, and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim.
You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. And the mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Clare, our patroness, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and David, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity, in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. May your sacraments, O Lord, we pray, perfect in us what lies within them, that what we now celebrate in signs we may one day possess in truth, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. The Mass is ended.